<laughs> this is Rumi's poem, Chickpea to Cook. A chickpea leaps almost over the rim of the pot where it is being boiled. Why are you doing this to me? Don't you try to jump out. I'm torturing you. I'm giving you flavor so that you may mix with spices and rice and be the lovely vitality of a human being. Remember when you drank rain in the garden? That was for this. The cook knocks him down with the ladle. Oh <laughs> Grace first, pleasure, then a boiling new life begins. And the friend has something good to eat. Eventually, the chickpea will say to the cook, Boil me some more. Hit me with a skimming spoon. I can't do this by myself. I'm like an elephant that dreams of gardens back in Hindustan and doesn't pay attention to his driver. You're my cook, my driver, my way into existence. I love your cooking. The cook says, I was once like you, fresh from the ground. Then I boiled in time and boiled in the body, two fierce boilings. My animal soul grew powerful. I controlled it with practices and boiled some more and boiled once beyond that and became your teacher. I'm giving you flavor so that you may mix with spices and rice and become the lovely vitality of a human being. Hi. Um, we're going to do something a little different today to give you a sample of what we do in the Sacred Poetry Group, which meets every couple of weeks um, in the fall and in the winter. Um, it'll be resuming Monday, January 4th. Um, we read a wide variety of mystical, spiritual poets, uh, one of whom especially is Rumi, of whom you've already had a taste this morning. Um, Rumi, as many of you know, was a, um, um, a Muslim in the 12th, in the 13th century, 1200s. Um, he lived in eastern Turkey uh, in a town called Konya, and he's called Rumi because that uh, part of Turkey was, had been Romanized, and so he was, he was, this is a very short version of his name. Um, <clears throat> so this was at the same time as St. Francis in Italy, and uh, the building of cathedrals in uh, Northern Europe and Italy. Um, it was also a very high point of Persian civilization, of which uh, Rumi is part. Um, he wrote in the Farsi, the Persian language, and he's really a treasure of um, Muslim culture and, and world culture, and he's become known in, in the English-speaking world <coughs> primarily in the last 20 years, uh, thanks to some wonderful translations that uh, Coleman Barks and other people have published. So our th procedure now is to, uh, is to read uh, these poems, and then we'll, um, I'll invite you to, uh, anybody who feels like it, to respond, um, take turns, and I'll, I'll hand the uh, microphone around.
Would you like to do it? Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Um, but first of all, we need uh, to read the poem. Um, one of our uh, one of our regulars, maybe. Um, anybody like to step forward and, and read the chickpea poem for us? Thanks, Betty. When you saw the chickpea, now you get to hear the chickpea. A chickpea leaps almost over the rim of the pot where it's being boiled. The cook knocks him down with a ladle. Don't you try to jump out. You think I'm torturing you. I'm giving you flavor so you can mix with spices and rice and be the lovely vitality of a human being. Remember? When you drank rain in the garden, that was for this. Grace first, sexual pleasure, then a boiling new life begins and the friend has something good to eat. Eventually the chickpea will say to the cook, boil me some more, hit me with the skimming spoon, I can't do this by myself. I'm like an elephant that dreams of gardens back in Hindustan and doesn't pay attention to his driver. You're my cook, my driver, my way to existence. I love your cooking. The cook says, I was once like you, fresh from the ground. Then I boiled in time and boiled in the body, two fierce boilings. My animal soul grew powerful. I controlled it with practices and boiled some more, and boiled once beyond that, and became your teacher. <clears throat> Anybody have a response of any kind, a comment, a question, a curiosity? <clears throat> For a good boiling, I suggest you join a committee. <laughs> if you aren't boiling enough already. <laughs> I disagree somewhat with this uh, sentiment. I don't think life necessarily has to be torture. <laughs> torture. Well, let's hope not. <laughs> I think what I get from this, and following up on Bob's comment, torture, all of this boiling, everything is torture unless you look at it, look at it through your mind and say, "Oh, this does have a beneficial outlook." While I'm next to Chuck, I love the phrase "the lovely," so you can mix with spices and rice and be the lovely vitality of a human being. That is so optimistic that the plant can grow and turn into us. It's sort of like the whole stardust theme, that we are all stardust. This one would be, make a lot more sense if it was about a lobster. Yeah, you know, I was, in, I was kind of trying to figure out what the analogy really was, and when someone over here mentioned torture, and then over here you brought up the line about the food, I kind, of, I kind of disagree with torture. I think that this has a lot to do with nourishment, and there's a twist between where we find, you know, eating, eating is a violent thing, you know, it's, we have to eat, we have to destroy to take and nurture. I think that's kind of what it's trying to tell us. 
You have to boil to soak in and to drink and indulge in the brine of life. And I think you brought that up when you mentioned the line, because that's what I was thinking during that line. And it's, it's just like life. It takes good, it takes bad, it takes all of it to recognize what's worth eating. I don't eat meat at least four or five days a week because I keep seeing them talking to me, you know, the meat talks, you know. <laughs> cows moo and pigs grunt and now you've got chickpeas talking to me how the heck am i supposed to eat chickpeas from now on this recalls for me julia child at her most wonderful with wielding the, the spoons or the whisks and things. For me, it's really about life and life experiences. And the cook says, not just that you have the experiences, but he points out that his animal soul grew powerful. I controlled it with practices. And Rumi does uh, talk of, Rumi was a, a real mystic leader and did practice to become the person he did. And I think he's partly suggesting we need the life experiences to be, be human. And then it's good to also have practices that make us whom we want to be. Um, boiling softens things and helps to uh, dissolve to create a unity uh, uh, and uh, increases complexity and, and uh, flavor. Hi. Um, the line that appealed to me is, um, I can't do this by myself. I'm like the elephant that dreams of the gardens back in Hindustan and doesn't pay attention to his driver. I think there's a period there. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did a lot of studies on death and dying and she said, one does not grow when you sit in a uh, little English garden and is served tea, but you grow and develop and you learn by being in a place where you are roiled and broiled and things like that. So I think this is telling us that we become bigger and better people by having uh, things thrust upon us and we learn to empathize with others that way. I guess I just wondered if the cook and the friend were necessarily the one and the same. I didn't know. <laughs> I think I'm a little bit mess, mystified by that line, grace first, sexual pleasure, that's all great, then a boiling new life, and who is this friend who is going to, who is going to have something to eat from all of this? Is that the devil? <laughs> well, let's hope it's not the devil. <laughs> that's a very good question, Adrian. Um, Rumi uh, uses lots of metaphors. I mean, his, his uh, poetry is simply 99.9% .9 metaphor. Um, and uh, the friend is his term for Allah, for God. And of course, he's alluding to the merciful um, side of God when he calls him the friend. And that's basically his whole conception of God is, is um, um, the friend, the, the helper. Um, so when the friend winds up eating you in this metaphorical, <laughs> in this poem, <laughs> you've got an interest, you've got something to think about, right? I mean, people, uh, people have said several, made several useful comments on uh, what it is, what the goal is of the um, 
the learning process that he's describing on the phone. Is it something like a reunion with the Godhead? Sorry? Is it something like a reunion with God, with the Godhead? In effect, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. One more? On one hand, I agree. On the other hand, I don't agree. I think the, there is a universal wish to be exempt from suffering. That, that is why me, uh, that, uh, that echoes throughout. And, um, and then the um, phrase, um, uh, being almost being tested or stewed to a new form uh, is as the result of suffering. I reject that thesis. Um, I thought I lived that thesis for the long time until I saw the light. You might think of uh, the Buddhist teaching that life is suffering. However we interpret that. Um, maybe it's simply in as much as life involves death. So. I like to think of the friend as my very intimate inner companion that is about a place of pure um, compa compassion, uh, is beyond life's conditioning of suffering. So when I suffer, I am like that chickpea. I am broken open out of the limits of time and I, I break open into the friend and the friend is always there for me. But I sometimes need to have that spoon come down on my head to, uh, to uh, help me remember this beautiful companion I have within me. Some of this learning we'd probably rather avoid, if possible. Um, I think maybe we should save a few minutes for the remaining poem. Who would like to read this for us? Bill, did you want to read one? The Breeze at Dawn. The Breeze at Dawn. The Breeze at Dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Thank you. So I think this poem is about that liminal space we find ourselves in often, don't know it, not knowing which direction to go in. It's not always that comfortable, but it's sometimes a place that we need to be. On the door sill. This reminds me of one of my favorite meditation books called Each Day a New Beginning um, to keep moving forward and not go back to sleep as if as it would have been very easy to do this morning. Um, and oftentimes that sometimes happens. And um, but every time I do not not go back to sleep, I think that's a double negative or something. Um, I hear something here I need to hear. Thanks, Bob. I like this poem very much because I'm sick at home a lot, so I'm indoors for many, sometimes a week at a time. 
And um, this reminds me of that moment when I wake up in the morning, usually way before everybody else. And I have to remind myself that there's still a viable world outside my door and not to forget, even though you might be busy or asleep at the wheel in your own life, there's still a world out there where people are loving and caring. The door is round and open. And so it just reminds me to be whole and honest with myself and know that I can go outside and be with other people. There's a world out there, not to forget. Thank you. I often equate these, this poem with uh, Thoreau's line about living a life of quiet desperation. I think it's an admonition to all of us to not live a life of quiet desperation, but to be courageous, not accept uh, fate for what it is, but to try to shape the fate for the future. I'm fascinated by the fact that the door is round. I, I imagine in some cultures doors are round, but it's not our typical experience. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, how does that change our experience, the fact here that the, the door is round? I don't, uh, and, and I find myself just kind of dwelling on that. <laughs> What the door being round says to me is that he's calling each new day a rebirth. Um, see, um, at least for uh, sorry, at least for some time, I've tried to study Sufism because I've worked in um, Afghanistan, and one of the things that because of people who are constantly giving me some of the poetry and trying to explain it to me, which I didn't always understand. But at least one of the things that I, I understood about the culture and Sufism was that there is a duality of understanding, both the physical and the spiritual. So just especially on how like for them it was, there are rituals where that all they are thinking about is just godliness and spirituality and love and et cetera. Like even some of their, what was it? Uh, uh, Dakir, I think is the way I might be mispronouncing it. You can probably look it up on YouTube, where all they're doing is spinning, rechanting names of God over and over and over again in their uh, meditations. So um, the looking at the word that don't go back to sleep, don't go back to your old way of thinking, don't, um, don't just think about the physical, think about the spiritual. Um, don't go back into whatever your old mindset was. Don't go back to sleep. That, that's what it brings. Um, what this brings to me is to um, be in the present moment. And going back to sleep might even be doing something. <laughs> and he's, he's asking you, you know, to first you must ask what you really want before you go back to sleep, which might just be activity. And that the door is round and open is sort of the expanse of the moment. It expands in, in everywhere, um, and it's not just a directionality. In fact, it's lack of that. Yes, I'm always out running in the pre-dawn hours and that sort of thing, and I would have to say it's something to try because during that time, when your short-term memory catch is relatively empty and you've just woken up, that there's, a, I would say the two worlds would be your conscious and your subconscious mind, and you would be surprised what starts coming up, just the minor visual stimuli or sounds and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um. I think the door is round because we Western civilization people think in terms of linear beginnings and ends and duality, up and down, black and white. And a better way, I would think, 
would be the circular way without beginnings and ends. And that's why the door is round. For me, this poem was about this morning. <laughs> are, are we awake? I, uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, sort of sound a, a note of caution, because sometimes when we read things like round here, we try to put some kind of a spiritual meaning on it, or we look desperately for something that is a metaphor. But in fact, it could very well be that doors were really round at that time. <laughs> and I, I have had that occasion before when people tell me when they see the Indian, the Native, Native American, uh, scribblings or like spirals on uh, on a rock and and they tell me for a long time about the spiritual meaning of that spiral but we have to be careful because it could be doodling and and so I, I don't want to be you know to make fun of it but we have to be very careful about our interpretation has meant a lot of a lot of hundred interpretations bloom right <laughs> Roughly speaking, and, and uh, don't get fixated on one of them. I think we should probably wind up pretty soon. This, uh, this is like an everyday thing for me. <laughs> um, don't go back to sleep, don't go back to sleep, because I have many days where that's all I want to do is sleep. And with, you know, working several jobs and, and all the things that I have to do for my family and et cetera, et cetera, Sometimes I just don't want to face the day. And I think it was somebody back here said, but usually when I do, I do get something out of it. And oftentimes I hear or see something that I really need to have heard or seen. Um, and I go, well, okay, so it was a good thing I got up and moved this morning. <laughs> but sometimes it's hard. I would like to just sleep my life away some days. Somebody have a hand up that I don't see? Yeah. <clears throat> we'll give you the last word, Anne. <laughs> well, an addendum on uh, Adrian's comment. I think that um, a writer or an artist um, creates with metaphors, and I think that we, the people, do in the communication process, um, we see things that the artist maybe even consciously didn't intend different levels of meaning. And I don't think it makes it, um, I think that it, it just enlarges it. And that's the beauty of communication. And, uh, you know, just as in life, uh, we never know the effect that we have on other people. And uh, unless someone tells us years later. So I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it goes two ways. Thanks, Anne. Yes, I have one uh, thing that I'd like to say about the poem. My favorite line is, ask for what you really want. Don't settle. <laughs> Get, you know, go for what you really want. Um, that's it. Thanks, everybody. I love this very much.